Hello everyone, this is Al Fadi, and I want to welcome you back to a continuation of this fascinating uh, new series. Uh, we called it Putting It All Together, which is basically a historical criticism of Islam, or let's say early Islam, or the origins of Islam, if you wish. And in the last at least couple of episodes, we talked already about what does that mean, and also last time we talked about what we called the standard Islamic narrative. Today we're going to continue along these lines, and we are going to, at least uh, as an overview, talk about the book The Man and the Place. And with me here, of course, just by saying these phrases, uh, you know, we have uh, the man who talks about all of this, and that's our dear brother, Dr. Jay Smith. Dr. Jay, thank you so much for always making yourself available for us and uh, for really pouring your heart into uh, this uh, amazing, amazing uh, research, uh, many new discoveries. In fact, uh, we mentioned we're doing this in 2022 because guaranteed, uh, maybe later this year or next year, who knows, maybe something new will come in and we'll keep updating all of that. Why are we concerned about the book, The Man and the Place? Well, I'm concerned about it because I'm the one that coined that phrase. Uh, before, everybody was trying to f find how is it and what is it that we were really questioning. And I decided to come up with the Book of the Man, the Book of the Man. I've been doing this since the 1990s. Then I added the place to it to make it a meme, a real quick meme, so you can see and understand it, visualize it, and also be able to uh, discuss it and debate it. The book, the man, and the place, because those are the three criteria that really underline. Those are the pillars. That's the foundation of Islam. One book called the Quran, one man called Muhammad, and one place called Mecca. You need those three. You take away one of them, the other two come crashing down. So anytime you take one of those three away, the other two come crashing down, Islam comes crashing down. It's as simple as that. So what is it we want to look for? Well, what we're going to do in this series, we're going to start with Mecca. So what do we want to do? Why Mecca? Well, Mecca is foundational for the other two. If there is no Mecca, that puts that means no either neither the Quran or Muhammad could come from that from that area. They must there must be another Quran we're talking about or another right. Muhammad. And he is as we're going to find out, he is from much further north and it is from much further north. In fact, I'm not even going to say he. I don't really care if there is a Muhammad or not. I would suggest there is no Muhammad. And even the Muhammads we're trying desperately to look for are someone else. Because Muhammad's a pretty common name. Did I say name? It's probably better known as a pretty common title. This right. is a title, not a name. We can definitely agree on the fact that it, it is a title for sure. I take the position that there was someone that existed, but maybe his character has been embellished and improved and enhanced over the course of time. But what would we want from Mecca? Okay, Mecca, we want a number of things. We want to say, did this place exist prior to the 7th century or even in the 7th century? Why is that crucial? Well, because if there, it didn't exist prior to the 7th century or within the 7th century, then you can throw Muhammad in the, and the Quran out real clearly. And you can pretty much say that the standard Islamic narrative has an enormous gaping hole. Because the standard Islamic narrative is very clear that everything we know about the early origins of Islam, everything we know about Muhammad, everything we know about the Quran, everything we know about what happened to Muhammad, what he said, where he did, where he went, everything that happened in that uh, between 570 and 632 when he died, takes place in this area. It all takes place in the Hijaz. That is where Mecca and Medina are. Or that's at least what allegedly being told to us that it took place during that time frame, but evidence sources do not. No, no. Well, the standard Islamic narrative yeah. is very clear. There, yeah. He didn't live anywhere else. Right. He may have moved and gone on caravans other places, but where he lived, where he received the Quran, where he married, where he had his children, where he started Islam, where the, the Khilafat began, everything about Muhammad, everything he said takes place in that area. That's why we're going to start with that. We have to do that. So I want to find any reference, any evidence. Is there any map? that points it, that gives us there. Uh, is there any artifact? Are there any Qiblas that are facing that place? Is there any reference, uh, to, uh, any book or any reference from the 7th century or earlier that talk about, are there any civilizations, or any people that refer to that? Mm -hmm. So we're going to ask that question. We have to ask that question. And then we're going to answer and say, absolutely not. And there's a reason why no one has heard of this place. And it all comes down to one word, water. It's as simple as that. There's just no water. Now, I'll just let you hang in, because you know where I'm going to go with this, and right. you're going to see why this is so important. The second area we're going to look at is 
the the person himself. Now, we're not going to really call Muhammad. We're not going to even talk about Muhammad. I, I'm going to take a bias. I'm biased here. I don't believe there was ever a Muhammad. Uh, of, uh, there was any. There was someone called Muhammad. There are many people called Muhammad. Listen, my name is Jay. There's lots of Jays living today, and I'm sure there are lots of Jays uh, all over the world. But is there a Jay that's sitting in this studio that I can support historically? Yes, because I'm right here. Can we say the same thing about Muhammad? Is there a man or was there a man named Muhammad who was born in Mecca, who then was there till 622 when he moved to Medina and spent the last 10 years of his life in Medina? Is That's all I'm asking. And did he receive a book called the Quran? So we're going to look at the origins. I'm going to call it really origins because we want to look at the evidence on the ground. And what, I want, what I'm going to demand is show me one piece of evidence. That's all I'm asking. Give me a coin. Show me a rock inscription. Show me a building that refers to this man or this place or this uh, these events that are happening. That's the second one that I want to look at. And that's extremely important, by the way, because uh, remember, I grew up believing in a man by the name of Muhammad, born specifically in 570 at a historical event that took place, you know, the, the elephant, you know, basically, or the year of the elephant and the incident that took place at that time. And then uh, in 610, he was in a cave. He received his revelation. And that continued for at least 13 years in Mecca. And then he migrated to Medina the last 10 years. I mean, these are specific time frames that I grew up believing in. But yet, like you stated correctly, when we look at the sources to back it up, we don't have enough sources to back it up. Not even, I'm not aware of any that can pinpoint these exact dates for us. If you look at the Sira, for instance, you look at the Hadith collection and you look at the Tafsir and all that kind of stuff, everything is later and also troubling uh, to me uh, is that it points north, not south. Okay, so here's what the question I'm going to ask. I, when I did my debate with Dr. Jamal Badawi back in 1995 and I started giving these 10 historical problems with the origins of Islam, his answer to me at that time was, Mr. Smith. The absence of evidence does not mean that there is evidence of absence. Which mm -hmm. is, of, you've heard this phrase many times, and that's mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. Just because there's an absence of evidence does not necessarily suggest the evidence of absence. I couldn't respond to that at that time in 1995. We're now in 2022. Now I can. And what we're going to show when we get through this period is we're going to show there's a huge amount of evidence. And we're going to show you what the evidence is. But what we're looking for, we're looking for five things. We're looking for a book called the Quran. We're looking for a man named Muhammad. We're looking for people called Muslims. We're looking for a religion called Islam. And we're looking for a city called Mecca. Those are the five things I want to ask. And I want to see if they exist, if there's any evidence for those five things. If there's no evidence for those five things, because those are the five things that make up Islam or the origins of Islam, then I was going to turn that on its head that whole phrase on its head and says, now you Muslims, you now have no evidence. So the, av uh, the absence of evidence in your case, does it suggest the evidence of absence? I would suggest that you've got this problem, no longer me. I've got the evidence. You no longer have the evidence. Until you can show me evidence for any of these five things in the seventh century, there is no debate. Because why debate? Because I'm not, I'm fed up and I'm, you're wasting my time to always be pointing to the 9th and 10th and 11th century. Who cares dilly swat about the 9th, 10th, 11th century? I want to talk about the 7th century. Now, do you see how easy yeah. that makes it? But also, that is what we demand of any historical claim. We've been demanded of that in Christianity. We had to prove that there was a person named Jesus Christ living in the first century, that he did die on the cross. Whether he rose again, we didn't have to prove that, but that is been proven. That's the beauty of it. We had to prove that the New Testament, the, the record that we have, uh, the, the, the New Testament itself had to have been written at least by the second uh, by the first century, written down by the first century, though we don't have any of the manuscripts from that earliest period. So that's why we then had to, by doing that, since the last 200 years, we have been doing that. And that's why since we've done it, I'm going to demand it of Islam. I will demand that of any religion that makes historical claims. In the last two minutes of, of this, uh, well, let's talk about the last piece, which is what would you want from the Quran, the book? This is the biggest one, and that's why I'm leaving it to last. The biggest one is the one that worked that really is going to be the crowning, the, the crowning hole, the biggest hole of all of them. The biggest hole is the book itself, this book, Quran right here. 
This should be easy to find in the 7th century. There should be a litany of manuscripts because the Muslim traditions do say it. The standard Islamic narrative is very clear that this book was compiled and written down in its final form in 652 by Uthman. Zaidi bin Thabit, who was given commission to do that, sent to five different cities, five different cities which still exist today, all of which have been controlled by Islam for the last 1400 years. There should be no problem finding those five manuscripts. Where are they? Not only that, is there any Quran that all those manuscripts that parallel this. More than that, what do we know now about how the Quran was put together? And at the very end of all our discussions, I'm going to ask and put, put to, to you, where did this Quran come from? Not only that, but uh, even if we're talking about manuscripts to match this, but do we even have a complete Quran from the seventh century that matches this? That's a whole different story, of course, based on what we know. And so at far. the very end, I want to show you, we now pretty well know where the Quran came from. And guess who it's all about. But that's for the end. Which we did also another series about this, but I will not really spoil uh, that for uh, yet. What are we going to talk about next time? We're now going to introduce and look at the source problem. And I'm going to show you some graphs. We've seen it before. We're going to unpack and say, why are these graphs important? Look at the timelines. We need to put the whole problem with the source difficulties in a timeline. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, hopefully everyone uh, is enjoying this. And uh, we look forward to having you next time. Until then, have a blessed day.